Welcome to the Anxiety Slayer series. Our mission is to assist you with creating more peace and tranquility in your life through anxiety release exercises and supportive tools created to slay your anxiety. Today's Anxiety Slayer podcast is brought to you by the Anxiety Slayer Academy. We've been offering a free podcast for almost nine years to help anyone suffering with anxiety find relief. And now we're helping you go deeper by providing step-by-step support on how you can get the best experience from our favorite tools and techniques for overcoming anxiety. Welcome back to Anxiety Slayer. I'm Shan Vanderleek, here today with clinical counselor and author, Sharon Selby. Sharon is a registered clinical counselor, and it's her passion to support children, teens, and families struggling with anxiety. For the last 20 years, she's accumulated over 10,000 clinical hours working with children and families, experiencing diverse challenges, and has a broad range of experience to draw upon. Sharon is also the author of Surfing the Worry Imp's Wave, an engaging and in-depth children's book that teaches all about anxiety and how to overpower it. Our intention today is to give parents a lot of valuable content about how you can support your anxious child. Welcome to Anxiety Slayer, Sharon. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to have you join us today. I'd like to dive right in with our first question. And it's a big one. Uh, How on earth can we help change our children's negative thoughts, which create all of this anxiety that they suffer? Mm, That is a big question and definitely one of the key points with anxiety. I think the first part is to really help our children understand that all our thoughts are not real. So when we're younger, we do think all our thoughts are real. And then that also gets perpetuated by the characters at Disneyland or the different kinds of holiday celebrations that we might celebrate that have characters associated with them. And so as children get a little bit older, they start to differentiate between reality and fantasy. That usually happens around age seven. And if we can help children to realize all their thoughts are not real. And so then we have some specific tools we teach them, such as looking for evidence. And that helps to combat the anxiety. What kind of evidence would they be looking for? Well, for example, if they were feeling nervous going to a new activity, which is a very common time to be feeling anxious, usually there's some children that are feeling quite nervous and look quite anxious, and then there's some that just look comfortable and are going um, with ease. And so if they look around and they see those children that look quite comfortable, maybe they've been there before, they're chatting to the leaders who are leading the activity, and the child can have the evidence that this is a safe place and this is a friendly place and other kids enjoy coming here so I can as well. Ah, Great. Anxiety at school seems to be bigger than ever and not only because of the class loads and peer acceptance and hormones for the older children but now dealing with in in the U.S., school shootings, suicide, bullying. Uh, My goodness, what can we do to support our kids when they feel the weight of the world on their shoulders? There's just so much stress. Mm -hmm, There really is. And I think the difference between nowadays versus previous generations is before when children were at school, they still had pressures to deal with. But when they came home, they were able to get away from it for a while. And that was their safe place. And and they could just escape the peer pressure and the social pressures and, and other kinds of things. Now with social media, the kids come home from school and then right away they're on their phone and they're checking Instagram and checking Snapchat. And they're seeing, you know, who's doing what and If they've been excluded from, you know, a group that's getting together, uh, who's looking so beautiful because they've photoshopped their photograph, Um, the pressures have really now come home as well. So that unless the parents and children have an agreement to stay off phones, 
Um, there's not really a break from it. And that's adding a lot of anxiety. And then what about the rest, the bullying, the, Mm -hmm. you know, the, the fact that these kids might know other children who are depressed or families who have children who've committed suicide or my goodness, the, the school shootings that, Mm -hmm. that, you know, my, my daughter asked me at, I think 10 years of age, what, what to do if, if something like that happened. And I just, my heart broke for her and now she's a senior and um, was, you know, part of a school walkout in the States to say, Hey, enough is enough. Kids are suffering. And so I wonder if you could speak to that a little bit as well. Yeah. And so I think, you know, the importance of home being the solid rock and the solid foundation is really important so that it's a place where children can ask those kinds of questions and process their feelings. Um, It is scary, the school shootings. Although, unfortunately, you know, I know there's been a number we can still point to the statistics and use evidence that it's still, you know, rare that this could actually happen at her school. Um, I'm making an assumption there, but, you know, depending on where you are and and looking at your statistics. Um, I know in Canada, where I'm from, we do have routine lockdown drills that the schools will do with the elementary schools and the high schools. So if there was an intruder in the building, there's a plan in place and they do this quite regularly. So I'm imagining in the United States, they probably have a similar uh, they, protocol. They do. And, and while I appreciate that they do, there's still uh, such, so much anxiety around the fact that they even have to do the drill, you know, that they, mm-hmm. so, so the evidence, mm-hmm. so the preparation, yes, that's, some some support, but there are some kids who are just really, uh, truly frightened that it is going to happen at their school. Absolutely. And unfortunately, you know, we, we don't have a crystal ball and we don't right. know the future. And so one of the other tools that we use um, to help with anxiety is practicing staying in the present. And so when we start having these thoughts about, you know, what if this happens or could this happen, we are going into the future. And so although we don't want to ever minimize how our child's feeling, and so we do want to talk about, you know, the statistics hopefully being low and that there is a plan in place should this happen, we also then have to explain that it's really important to stay in the present um, because otherwise we could just spend our whole life worrying, worrying about sure. so many things. You know, Vancouver's, you know, known as being an area that could have a big earthquake one day. And so we could worry all the time that there's going to be a big earthquake. But all we can do is have our emergency kits ready. Mm-hmm. And know there's a plan in place if it should ever happen. But then we have to still carry on with life, and it's it's the whole thing about trust versus fear. Sure, and sure. Staying in the staying in the present moment as much as you possibly can. Mm-hmm. Exactly, with what we know to be true right now, and that's the only moment that we actually really have control over. Oh, thank you. That's really helpful. The other piece that I wanted to talk about today, or the other question I wanted to talk about today, was. How can we tell as parents if our child is introverted or if they're socially anxious? Hmm, That's a really good question. And they do often get confused. And so when a child is introverted, that is more of a personality trait. So this is more about how the child is wired and how they recharge their batteries. That's how I like to explain it to kids and teens. So if you're the kind of person who um, enjoys meeting out with friends and and doing things, but really still finds that having time alone is what recharges your battery, that's going to be your clue that you're more introverted. When you're socially anxious, you have a lot of fear around your thoughts. And so it's not just that you 
because you could also be socially anxious and introverted. So it's not so much that you're, you know, quiet because you are needing some downtime. It's that you are in the on guard kind of mode and you're being really cautious and hypervigilant because it's as though you have a little antenna on your head that are looking for all the possible fears that could happen, especially around the fear of being judged, uh, the fear of being shamed. Mm -hmm. What will other people think of me? And so it's more about those types of thoughts when you're socially anxious, even though it can sometimes present the same. It's digging deeper to find out, you know, what is it that's meeting the child's needs right now? Is it that they're withdrawing because they just feel like their energy is depleted and they're needing to recharge? Or are they withdrawing because they have the fear of all the what ifs and what could happen or what could people be thinking about them? Well, it's so still pretty tricky to, to balance that, especially because you could be or your child could be introverted and anxious <laughs> and socially mm-hmm. anxious. So, yeah, I wondered about that. Uh, I, you know, I, I didn't realize that I was m- more of an introvert than an extrovert until later, later in my life because I had trained my whole life to be an extrovert. <laughs> uh-huh. yes. But then I learned that really my batteries are absolutely recharged during a long time and see, okay, uh, because anybody that would guess would say, no way, you're not an introvert. Absolutely, I am. I do not, my, ch- my batteries do not get charged by other people. I enjoy other people, but mm-hmm. they get charged when I can have that alone time. So I know there's a, a lot of children who are, the, who are the same way. But again, in the school setting, uh, most of us are being trained to be more extroverted. Yes, the school setting does tend to... Um favor the extroverted way because they do have children working a lot in groups and there's not a lot of places you can go to have quiet time. Although I know um, in our province, self-regulation has become quite a hot topic. And so now there's often noise canceling headphones available that children can use. So that can help give them a bit of quiet time. And sometimes in the younger classrooms, there's a little cozy corner where they can go. So I'm glad that different learning styles are being recognized and different um, ways of having energy as well. So let's move on and talk about a little bit more about parents and how as parents we can support our children and really what we could expect from an anxious child. You get yourself, or at least in in my experience, I've gotten myself into places where I'm not really sure how much I can ask of my daughter when she's feeling anxious. I think you refer to it as, you know, how far can they be pushed? Um, Mm -hmm. Or uh, what what can we expect? And how long should it take for them to move through the, the present emotional state in order to get back to homework, get back to chores, get back to being a part of family dinner or, you know, whatever it is, you know, insert the, uh, the activity here, right? Mm -hmm. So it's important to always be moving in the right direction. So you're always moving towards your goal. And so, for example, uh, sometimes children are scared of doing swimming lessons in a group. And that's, you know, fearful because the water is scary Being in a group setting with children you don't know is scary. You don't know the teacher. So there's all these different factors. So in that case, we would want to set up a step-by-step plan so that perhaps, you know, they get used to the swimming pool first and you go there as a family. And then maybe if they're not ready for the group lessons, you could organize to do um, one private lesson with the instructor that will be leading the group lessons. So the child can get to know the instructor and feel more comfortable. Then you go to the group lessons and you explain the situation and ask if you can sit, you know, quite close by so your child feels secure, but with the goal that we're getting the child to be part of the lesson. And so it's like a staircase where you start off with the easiest step and then you try to just keep moving up step by step until you reach your final goal. And that's the key with anxiety 
is if we avoid, we're actually feeding the anxiety and it will increase and get bigger. Right. And so it's important that we are moving towards the anxiety, even though that doesn't feel comfortable. And that's usually, you know, the thing that people least want to do. But I love how compassionate and supportive your example is. Mm -hmm. We did that, you know, a a similar, my husband and I um, in the Montessori program that my daughter went to when she was young. Mm. It really followed that case where you get to come see the, see the classrooms, you know, get to know where your locker might be, get to see some other kids, but, um, it's not really a long period of time and, but it gets you acclimated and then you bring them back and, and uh, maybe have a meeting with the teacher or what have you and just do it, do these things in such a loving mm-hmm. way, in such a supportive way, no matter whether your children suffer with anxiety or not, to, mm-hmm. to just be able to do things in, in that uh, with so much compassion. I, how can that not be a wonderful thing to do? Yeah, and I think once children understand that anxiety is not real, and what I mean by that is I know it feels so real in the body and in the mind, but anxiety is about the future and it's about the worries about what could happen. So when we say it's not real, what we mean is it's not happening at this exact moment, unless, of course, it's a true emergency. And then we differentiate it by calling that fear. That is true fear. And of course, that's when we go into our fight, flight, or freeze response. So the very first tool in my children's book is teaching children that we get false alarms and true alarms. And the true alarm is the true emergency. And the false alarm is when we're feeling anxious, but there's not a direct threat in front of us right now. And so when we realize that, it can help us to feel calmer My book's called Surfing the Worry Imp's Wave because I use this character, the worry imp, to be this mischievous character that's playing mind tricks on us to try to get us to be worried because it's important to externalize your worries and externalize the anxiety. So when they realize, you know, oh, that's that worry imp that's playing a trick on me, telling me, you know, not to go to my swimming classes... But then they realize, actually, it is okay, and it is safe, and I do feel comfortable. Then they can feel empowered because now they're in charge of themselves instead of having the worry imp or the anxiety being in charge of them. That's so great. And and what age group is is your book for? It depends, of course, on each child and, and where they're at with their cognitive abilities. But I say approximately ages 5 to 10. Okay. And really, you know, the 10 tools in there are for everybody, for teens and adults, but the way the book is written with the characters and the children's story, it's geared towards ages five to 10. And and where is your book available? On my website, which is SharonSelby.com. Okay. And soon it will be available on Amazon as well. It's just been released. So uh, right now it's available on my website. Well, congratulations. Thank that's, you. that's so great. Mm-hmm. In your experience, what is the best way that we can dial into our teenagers to support them when they feel like as parents, we just don't get it, mm-hmm. it being how they're feeling mm-hmm. that, you know, that, that comes with, you know, if you're, if you're really lucky, you might get an eye roll mm-hmm. or, <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, you know, I'm, I'm being silly. But I would really love to uh, dive into that a little bit more. And I know you've heard from a lot of teens and they have things to say that we need to hear. Mm -hmm. And quite often the teens will have their biggest complaint be that, you know, my parents don't understand and my parents don't listen. And I think a lot of times as parents, we're always coming from this caring heart, but we try to fix things. And teens don't want us to fix their problems. They just want somebody to listen and understand and validate. And so I have a little saying, which is feelings first, logic's last. And when a child is upset, they're not even able to be in that logical problem-solving place. 
their brain is just not ready for that because their emotional state is taken over. So we have to just validate their feelings. And if they ask for help solving a problem, then of course we can support them with that. But really they just want to feel heard. Yeah. Yeah. And I agree. And sometimes they don't want us to use emotional vocabulary that can, you know, feel too corny for them or too vulnerable for them. So sometimes we just, you know, stay more on the surface and say things like, yeah, sounds like you've had a bad day. And yeah, that's tough. And you just kind of use the lighter words instead Mm -hmm. of saying, you know, oh, honey, I can see you're feeling really upset. And then they yell back at you, no, I'm not upset. (laughs) Right. Clearly they are, but they just don't want to hear that right now. Right. The, the questions that the question that we've used and that I learned, and I think it's a Montessori thing as well is to ask, how do you feel and what do you need? Mm -hmm. And oftentimes they don't know what they need, but it, at least it kind of opens up that dialogue for them to, to let you know where they're at. I had a text today from my daughter. She did a presentation at school. Oh, yes. And a number of the kids laughed at her. Oh, really? And, um, and so she was upset. You know, this day is awful. Um, I did my presentation and a bunch of kids laughed at me. And my, my feedback was, that stinks. I suspect they weren't laughing at you. They were probably laughing at the material that you were sharing because they were um, working on Shakespeare in their English AP class, mm-hmm. interpreting some of Shakespeare's works. And there's some things that you can see, at least I can, a teenager's mind really thinking are really funny, that no matter who would be presenting the material Mm -hmm. and just kind of left it at that. Yeah. Depersonalizing it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and yet when she gets picked up from school today, there will be, you know, some extra mama love if if that's Mm -hmm. where she's at. Chances are, By the time I pick her up, she'll be over it. Yes, true. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I think when our teens, you know, don't want to talk, then um, just providing nurturance in other ways. So they might not tell us what they need, but maybe just getting them a cup of hot cocoa or a cup of tea or glass of water or, you know, doing some favorite baking or something, then that just shows, you know, you can leave it for them in their room and then you can you know, just drop it and then leave, but they know that you're thinking about them and that you're supporting them. Right. And that can be a way to start the conversation and maybe they come out later and start talking to you. Fantastic. You have uh, an incredible free gift available for our listeners today called Eight Common Mistakes to Avoid When Your Child is Anxious. Tell me a little bit more about that and uh, and then also where our listeners can can get their own copy. Mm-hmm. So um, this is an ebook that I put together because I realized that anxiety and how to manage it is not intuitive. And all the things that we would do as parents normally when our child is distressed can actually make the anxiety worse. And so I wanted to help parents realize how we can still support our children, but do it differently when it comes to anxiety. So that's why I created this ebook. So it's available on my website, SharonSelby.com. And also if you go to SharonSelby.com forward slash free ebook, then it's available there as well. Fantastic. Sharon, it's been such a pleasure talking with you today. And I'm really grateful for, uh, for your time and that you stepped forward to share your experience celebrating alongside of you with your brand new book mm-hmm. surfing the worry imps wave what a great tool great resource for kids and families it's really fantastic well thank you so much for having me and yes i'm so excited to have the book available so that there's a resource that can Um, be supportive for children from a young age so we can hopefully catch anxiety early before it gets to be at a state where it's much harder to manage. Mm, Right on. Sharon Selby is a registered clinical counselor and the author 
of a brand new book, Surfing the Worry Imps Wave. You can learn all about Sharon and her offerings as well as get her free gift at SharonSelby.com. Get everything you need to start slaying your anxiety today. Visit anxietyslayer.teachable.com to claim our free Anxiety Slayer Starter Course. You get four guided sessions, including an EFT tapping session, guided breathing practice, and special module on overcoming the fear of anxiety. Claim your free Anxiety Slayer Starter Course at anxietyslayer.teachable.com.